REITs are actually stocks, they're publicly traded companies. The big thing that makes them different is their corporate structure uh, and how that differs from like a, a typical common stock. So you've got your Google, that's actually structured as a C Corp. And the way it works is the government taxes them on their, their net income. And what uh, a REIT's different is they don't get that taxation on their net income. And that's part of how Congress set them up to be like this, this special structure to own real estate. And that allows them to pay dividends and it, it, it gives them an extra kind of edge. So while REITs are technically stocks, they're, they're a different entity that Congress has set up to, to own real estate and give the average investors the opportunity to own a, a great high quality portfolio of uh, cash flowing real estate. You are listening to the Million Acres Podcast. Our mission at Million Acres is to educate and empower investors to make great decisions and achieve real estate investing success. We provide regular content and perspective for everyone from those just starting out to seasoned pros with decades of experience. At Million Acres, we work every day to help you demystify real estate investing and build real wealth. Hello, I'm Deidre Willard, an editor at Million Acres, and thank you so much for tuning in to the Million Acres Podcast. I'm excited today to have Matt Talala with me to talk about some of the research he's done on Million Acres on REITs versus stocks. Now, REITs, as we've talked about on previous podcasts, are real estate investment trusts. And Matt is one of our most prolific writers on Million Acres. He writes a lot of our REIT content. He studied REITs for many years, and he always has great insights. I've learned a lot from him, so I'm excited to have him here. So welcome, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me again. So I'm really appreciative that you're going to do this with me. You published this piece on REITs versus stocks, which is in our Million Acres Research Center. And it looked at the historical performance of real estate investment trusts over time. And I thought this was really important because I think a lot of people don't know how REITs act compared to the S&P 500. Yeah, yeah. So what we wanted to do is just kind of answer that basic question is, that investors probably have is, is real estate a better investment than the stock market? And that answer actually changes every day because stocks go up and down every day. However, you know, I looked back on the data as far as I could go. And from 1972 to 2019, REITs actually outperformed the S&P 500. It was 13.3% versus 12.1%. So that gives us kind of a good idea of like, over the long term, REITs have done really well. They've outperformed the market. So for an investor that has a like a long term time horizon, a REITs would be a good place to partner your money um, to, to kind of, you know, if you're, if the idea is I want to outperform the stock market, then REITs is a good place to kind of go. And, you know, I broke down the, the information a lot different, a lot of different ways to kind of in that article to give people an idea of like how REITs have done di during different time periods. But the general thesis was uh, the longer you own a REIT, the better it performed versus the S&P 500. Great, thank you. Can you explain a little bit how uh, REITs are similar to other stocks and what makes them different? I know that they were started in 1960 to allow people to invest in commercial real estate. Yeah, so REITs are stocks. So we can, and that's probably where there might be some key confusion. They're publicly traded companies. The difference is in how they're taxed. So uh, a typical public company like your Amazon or your Google, that would be classified for tax purposes as a C corporation. And what happens is they make money and then the government tax them on their taxable income. And then if they pay dividends, you as an individual pay tax on the, then that as well. But a REIT is special structure. There's a couple of these special structures out there. Uh, another one's in energy uh, they're called Master Limited Partnerships. But these allow investors, REIT specifically, to own income producing real estate, but not get that double taxation. They're not taxed at the corporate level, so everything flows suits an investor and they get taxed once. And so one of the benefits of these REITs is they, they, they pay these big dividends. And so it's really great for a retirement investor or just somebody that wants to make some extra to cash. And so that's the basic difference. There, there's a lot of nuances in there of, you know, what a REIT can own and can't own, but it's basically a company that focuses on cash flowing real estate and pays a, a big dividend. Great. Thank you. So I want to go back to your uh, data a little bit because I noticed in looking at this, uh, the last 25 years and the last 20 years, REITs outperform stocks. But something's been happening, especially this, uh, especially last year where, uh, 
REITs have not performed as well. And I know that this year uh, in particular has been tough for real estate investment trusts. The data that I looked at, you know, if you go back 20 years, for example, the S&P 500 is up 7.7% and REITs are up 13.3%. And if we remember back 20 years, that was the dot-com bubble that burst. And so that was a big impact. So you have things like that that will impact performance. Now, in recent years, uh, we've kind of seen like a reversal of the dot-com bubble. Tech stocks have just been going crazy. And that has really helped pump up the S&P 500. And it's really kind of skewed the numbers towards um, the S&P. You know, last year, the S&P was up 31.5%. REITs were pretty close at 28.7%, but slight underperformance. This year has been a totally different story. The S&P is up about 8%. REITs as a whole are down 11.7%. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, you know, you can just say COVID and I think, you know, <laughs> but um, specific like retail has been just terrible. Um, office, you've got the work from home trends, uh, healthcare, seniors housing has been really a tough market. You have hospitality has been tough. It's just been a really tough year for real estate because there's so many unknowns. COVID's thrown a lot of unknowns into the real estate sector and that's kind of weighed on val uh, valuations. And it, it shows that, you know, over the short term, risk can be volatile, but, um, you know, if you look long term and you look at what a long, you know, a treat that's in a good long term trend, that could have a potential of outperforming in the long term. Well, I would say the positive of that is that there are some some deals to be had because obviously some of these REITs are trading below what they did in previous years. Uh, a lot of them, from what I've seen, followed somewhat the trends of this year where they went down in February and March and then recovered. Not all of them have recovered just because of some of the things you mentioned. Certainly retail REITs and hospitality REITs have been slower to recover, but this re this year is really an anomaly from what I've seen. And I think over time, real estate and especially real estate in investment trusts tend to be that sort of more predictable, steady stock as opposed to the tech stocks, which may s swing more dramatically. There, there's something in investing called beta, which is like how much of a, how a stock performs versus the S&P 500 and a low beta stock would be, have a lower correlation. And typically re REITs are like that. They have like a lower correlation. So if the S&P 500, you know, is up 1%, a REIT might be up half a percent or, or something like that. But this year has been totally different. And, you know, there's been just a lot of shocks to the real estate sector. You've got these unknowns like, what's the future of office? Are, are people ever going to go back to the office? Uh, can people afford to pay their rent? And what's the future of retail? And that's just been weighing on these. That's why we really haven't seen that bounce back that we've seen a lot of other sectors. Well, and that brings up another interesting point, which is just that with real estate investment trusts, you have this wide variety of types of things you can invest in. Uh, you know, you mentioned healthcare. We've talked a little bit about hospitality. Obviously, there are office REITs. And so there's really a wide variety of different types of real estate. And then also because of that, there's a wide variety of different types of, uh, of uh, returns based on those different sectors and how they're responding. Because right now, things are definitely responding differently across different sectors from what it looks like. Yeah. And one of the things I looked at in the article I wrote on REITs versus stocks was the subgroups and how they did. And um, NAIR REIT, which is the the uh, National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts, which is, I highly recommend their website, REIT.com. They have just a ton of great data on there that they update. And so they've been keeping track of the subgroup since 1994. And so I looked at how they perform versus S&P 500. And um, I broke it all out in the article. One of the ones that I want to highlight is self-storage, which really um, was kind of a big highlight um, since 1994, 16.7% total annual return versus the S&P at 9.3% during that time frame. So really wide outperformance. And then, so for comparison's sake, uh, one of the, the laggards was diversified real estate, uh, which really surprised me. Diversified real estate only returned 9.8% over that time. So you think like if I'm only owning a diversified portfolio of real estate, that would you know kind of benefit me. But in this case, one of the things that the research showed was that companies that focus tend to do better, they perform better. And, um, and a lot of that can be because of what the, the you know, you, you're diversified, but if you own hotels and you own retail, 
um, that might not be a great way to diversify. So, um, but yeah, each sector has, you know, kind of its own benefits and its own, you know, like right now we're seeing a lot of headwinds in different sectors, we're seeing tailwinds in other sectors. So that's one thing that like a, a beginner is look at what the re, what a REIT focuses on, because that could have a big impact on performance. Well, and self-storage is interesting too, because it is very easy to create self-storage. It's not, you know, it doesn't have the, uh, it's fast putting together a self-storage facility is a lot shorter than putting together like a new hotel or a new mall or a new office building or something like that. But I know there's also been some concern about maybe too much self-storage and whether or not the supply and demand ratios are potentially a little off. Yeah. And that was, um, you know, as I was kind of digging into the data, you know, long, long term self-storage is great, but near, you know, the past couple of years, it hasn't been quite as good. And that's because you've seen a lot of new players get in there, like private equity funds and institutional investors, because they can, they kind of like discovered, oh, you can get really great returns. And as that happens, you've got all this competition and they've just been building and building these self-storage facilities all over the place. And that's really uh, hurt returns uh, because because one thing, like the difference from self storage and office, you're not going to sign that long term lease. You know, it's usually month to month. And so, if uh, your competitor is building a new facility right down the street, and you've got all these month to month people, they can offer, hey, free rent for a month, or you know, they can really drive down the prices. And we've seen that a lot. But um, there's been kind of a notable shift in the sector in the last year or so where they're not building as much. And uh, one of the big players is public storage. They're uh, the, you know, they own like 9% of the market. So pretty massive player, but they've noticed like uh, it's, there's only going to build five billion more dollars worth of self storage streets or self storage capacity this year. Next year they think it's going to be four or less, and then you know kind of going down, and that'll help the market absorb it. So you know, and that's one of those things that investors should look at. Okay, it might be struggling now, but what are some like that lighter end of the tunnel that might turn things around? Well, you and you mentioned public storage, and one of the things that I've noticed from reading some of your work and some of the other writers on Million Acres is that there tend to be within each sector, I would say, usually three to five kind of big players and that tend to have a lot of, of, of the market share. Is that what you've seen in some of what, uh, what you've researched? Yeah, like there's probably, uh, I think, maybe five publicly traded self storage REITs, uh, public storage is the, the biggest. And then um, you have a lot of, even in how they operate, like public storage, they basically will buy the, the facility and own it and they make their money as like a real estate owner. Others um, out there will actually manage the facilities for third parties. And so they'll, they'll get, um, I think it's life storage. It, it, and that's like a big part of their business is managing these business for other, so they don't have to spend as much money even to to buy or build these facilities because they're basically putting their branding on it and that's allowing them to earn this management income so it really uh you know it would behoove an investor to you know not only look at what the portfolio but look at how they how they're growing and in self-storage I, I see different ways that they're growing and that that can have a big impact on you know, how much money they're spending, what their dividends are going to be. So it, you know, it, it can, it can be daunting. I'm sure, you know, to be like, I don't understand all this. And that's where, you know, we're trying to help, um, you know, readers get a better idea of what these companies actually do. Cause you see a broad sector of self storage, but there's a lot that a lot of differences in the companies, their balance sheets can be different. And so it, it really pays to kind of take a deeper look at what the underlying company is doing. True. And I think also one of the things, one of the misconceptions that I've seen is that people think, okay, if it's a real estate investment trust, it really is just real estate. But as you just pointed out, there are other things that different companies do. Uh, for example, Simon Property Group, which is uh, the biggest mall REIT, they all are also now investing uh, with partners in some of the uh, retail brands that actually are inside their malls. And there are other REITs that will they have real estate but they also may have a retail component or they may have some other component may, they may manage things and that's how they make their money yeah and you know so 
like a, a hotel REIT, one of the reasons they're really, really struggling is because instead of like owning the building and leasing it to a hotel operator, most of these um, like on a triple net lease, which you see that sometimes. And, and so a triple net lease that kind of protects you like the tenants paying everything and you're getting a steady rent check. In this case, they basically operate the hotels um, through a third party. And so, uh, you know, like each room is its own um, rental unit in a sense. And so when nobody's renting that room, they're not generating revenue. And that's why we saw, you know, if you looked at some of the numbers that these hotel REITs were posting, it's like 95% decline in, um, you know, revenue. And that is why their their stock prices have been hammered. So it's it's really understanding how these companies make money. You know, they do they like an office property? They'll have like a ten year lease with you know a top quality law firm versus you know, hey, this this room might not rent out for another month. And I just want to go back and define triple net lease for people because I know that when I was first looking at REITs, I would see uh, you know single tenant triple net lease, and I'd be like, wait, what? What is that? <laughs> so could you define that for people? Yeah, so it's, it's a lease structure where um, you know, so it's triple net. So the the tenants paying like the taxes, they're paying the insurance, they're paying all the expenses, and so basically the the owner of the property they're getting a, a very steady rent check as opposed to you know if you were paying the taxes or you're paying some of the utilities that could you know fluctuate. But it's basically you're getting a, a very very steady paycheck you know from these REITs every month. And uh, so that a lot of investors favor that stability that you'll see in a triple net um, lease structure. And in general, do those leases tend to be longer? I know one of the things that we see across REITs is that lease uh, lease terms can vary quite a bit. Offices tend to be longer. And so that's another factor for REIT investors to take a look at. Yeah, I think a lot of the companies that focus on that, that generally like the longer term leases, like uh, one of the, the triple net lease focus companies that I own, it's a, a diversified REIT called WP Carry. And I believe their average lease term across their business is 10 years. And they own industrial, they own restaurants, they own um, storage properties, uh, hotels, I think. So that, you know, that's a, they're very focused on that long term steady um, type of lease structure. So that's really another important factor for investors to look at is not just, so you want to look at what your REIT is investing in. You want to look at uh, the management, obviously. You want to look at what they're holding, how they make their money, but also their leases and what their leases look like over time. Another thing that I've seen also is vacancy rates, occupancy rates. That's obviously something that I think we're probably paying more attention to this year, at, at least uh that's what I've seen so far. Yeah, that and I'd even throw in like the credit quality of the tenants and even the credit quality of um, the company itself, because if the tenants don't have access to pay their rent when they're not open, the, you know, it, it just impacts things. But, um, you know, like it, it might sound like it's this daunting task to research REITs, but it's it's really not, you know, it's something that you have to build up over time. And, and it's something that an investor can like look for you know, specifically like a really, really high quality REIT. Um, so one that comes to mind is um, go with residential because that's not, you know, it hasn't been impacted as much, but a company like uh, Avalon Bay Properties or Avalon Bay Communities, high quality, one of the biggest REITs in the country, um, you know, they have a really good balance sheet and I think that's a very understandable business model because they own multifamily properties. So, you know, if you're an investor and you're thinking, oh, I could buy an apartment building down the street and then I would have to manage that and be a landlord, there's some work involved. Or I could buy Avalon Bay properties and own a diversified portfolio of these uh, of these uh, multifamily buildings and not have to do all the work. And that's kind of where the trade-off is. You have to do a little bit out of work up front to like research which, you know, for example, multifamily read I want to buy. But then, you know, it's really passive income after that. And that's the real benefit of, of you know, a REIT versus some of your other real estate investments. That is true. And I think that's one thing that gets people excited is that idea of passive investing. Obviously, anyone who has owned a rental property knows that it's it's a lot of work and it's a lot of dealing with tenants. At Million Acres, we have uh, several of our, um, of our writers and our staff members are also landlords for both uh, short-term and long-term investments. And I've certainly heard, heard some stories and uh, 
So that's that's something to consider. Another thing that people really like about REITs too is is those dividends. So some of them come in monthly, some of them are quarterly. I believe most most REITs, I would say, are, are quarterly dividend providers, but that's something that makes them really attractive for retirement portfolios, for example. Yeah, yeah. And actually, uh, the way Congress set up REITs, they're actually better to be owned in a retirement account because that, um, you know, the, there's qualified dividends and I think regular dividends. I'm not a very big on taxes. I, I you know, hire an accountant for all that stuff. It's way above my pay grade. But um, if you own this in a retirement account, it, it kind of doesn't matter because it'll only be the tax deferred if it's in a traditional IRA or it'll be tax exempt if it's in a, a Roth IRA. So that, you know, that'll let you uh, enable you to kind of um, have those dividends, you know, you can reinvest them and have them compound over time so that when you do retire, you've already got, you know, a ready income stream to kind of pull from. We're about halfway through our time, so I want to take a quick break and remind our listeners that if they are looking for further advice about investing in REITs, we have some great free resources available on MillionAcres.com. Our REIT investment guide has a comprehensive overview of the different types of REITs, the risk to be aware of, and everything else you should need to decide if investing in REITs is right for you. Check out the show notes for the link. In our next segment, Let's look at some of our data over time and also what is happening in REITs this year and some of the impact we are seeing. All right, we are back with Matt Delala, one of our REIT writers at MillionAcres.com and an active investor in a variety of real estate investment trusts. So today we're talking about the state of REITs and we're looking at some of our uh, data over time and also what is happening to REITs this year and some of the impact we've seen. So we've talked about some of the bad news with uh, you know office REITs and retail REITs and hotel REITs uh, having some tough times. But let's also cover some of the good news. Uh, for example, infrastructure and data centers are, are having a good year. Yeah, and I, we kind of mentioned this at the top of the show where technology stocks have just been going gangbusters this year. And these are REITs that focus on technology. So infrastructure REITs, uh, they're your cell towers. Um, the, there's some of them that'll own like some uh, fiber optic cables and 5G small cells. So they're going to focus on that side of things. And then your data centers, that's where a lot of these software as a service type companies will house their data. Um, and we just, we need more data. We need, you know, we're, even though right now we're stuck at home, uh, the whole idea of mobile communication, mobile data is, you know, going to be increasingly important. Anytime we do go out, we're checking our phones where, you know, if we're standing in line at a store, social distance, of course, but we're, you know, we're looking at the news and, and that's just going to continue. And, and that's just opening up the door for these REITs to, to really grow. And that's why, you know, there's, we've seen so much outperformance of them not only this year, but longer term, they've just been really a, a good place to go. So like if you wanted to get in on, you know, technology, but you know, like that, you know, you see the NASDAQ touching new highs and like, oh, that's kind of like nerve wracking. This is a, a, a lower risk way, I would say, of, of getting into some of these big technology trends. And, you know, there's uh, it's a bunch of different reads to kind of consider. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a just a, a good way to, like, get into a, a long-term trend with real estate. Well, and we talked earlier a little bit about leases. And another factor there is not just the leases themselves, but who the tenants are. So with data centers, you might have tenants that are, you know, Facebook, Google, Amazon, some of those big providers. And I think you see a similar thing across uh, industrial REITs, too, where some of those warehouses are leased to some of those huge tech companies. So you don't necessarily have to invest in the tech companies. You can also invest in the places where they are spending their money and uh, taking huge leases. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, industrial is another one. A lot of times when there's a sector that's challenged, so we talked about retails, you know, really struggling. But one of the opportunities for investors is kind of who's benefiting from what's killing retail, and that's industrial. You know, with more and more people 
shopping online, they need to build these distribution centers to kind of, you know, store this, all the stuff we're buying. And, uh, you know, so these industrial um, REITs have just been able to grow, you know, really a, at a fast pace by serving the this kind of backbone need of, of e-commerce. And, and that's, you know, there's, there's so much space that they need to build. And it's another really uh, good growth sector for real estate investors. Yeah, I read a CBRE study that uh, we will need a billion more square feet of storage or, or industrial space uh, by 2025, which is just amazing. And I know that Amazon is just is just expanding by leaps and bounds. Obviously, anyone who looked at their uh, quarterly results this uh, last quarter was it was huge. And part of that is just that they need more space constantly. So one of the one of the uh, industrial REITs that that I've invested in is one of the biggies is in uh, industrial, which is Prologis. Yeah, yeah, I, that's one of my favorites in that sector, just because they're they're really big and scale is a, an important thing uh, for real estate investors. It, it just gives them the opportunity to get in on more deals. More companies will come to them asking, "Hey, can you help us with this, uh, you know, project?" But they also have a great balance sheet. And one of the things I found is, you know, the the better the balance sheet, the the um, the least the less risky a REIT can be. And it just gives them so much flexibility. You, you'll see a REIT that has like a lower quality balance sheet, and they'll cut their dividend when times get tough because you know they need to protect their credit rating, which now allows them to borrow money cheaper. But if you're like a prologist and you've got like A rated credit, you just have that flexibility to keep paying your dividend if your customers, for example, aren't paying the rent, which wasn't the case for them. But uh, you know, so you've got that great balance sheet, that great size, the the brand awareness, and you know that's that would be like a low risk, high quality, you know, what you would consider like a blue chip REIT in that sector. Okay, you've mentioned balance sheet a couple of times, and I want to make sure that uh, that everyone who's listening understands like what that is and where they can find it and how they can kind of look at a REIT's balance sheet right uh, easily. Yeah, so a lot of REITs will have um, investor presentations on their website and they don't, you know, the balance sheet isn't the first thing anybody will focus on, but I found it to be like an incredibly useful tool to, to kind of see if things go south, which real estate's very cyclical every, you know, so many years we're going to have a downturn and this was one of the bigger ones, but the REITs that actually have this strong balance sheet. So there's different ways to look at a balance sheet. Uh, one of them is their credit rating and that's you know as a you know a borrower we know that you know fico score if you have a high fico score then it's easier to borrow money like for example i'm buying a house right now and i have a good fico score and banks were like yes we'll give you money for a house and and that's the same way with a um a reit if they have a high credit rating which you know for reits it's a b um c are the the ratings so if they have that a rating that it's going to be easier for them to borrow money and one of the things they'll look at is like a leverage ratio so how much income do they have versus their debt and there's there's different ways like diff, you know there's no standard for a REIT like if you were to look at at a REIT and one has a like 6.0 times leverage ratio that would be solid for one and not so solid for another and that's why you know, it really you have to know the REIT sector and and what is um, acceptable for each each one, and that's why I tend to like look, look at balance sheet first or credit rating first because that's that's more of an industry standard. If like Moody's, which is one of the big credit ratings, if they're giving it the stamp of approval of this is A rated, I can have a better uh, you know like comfort level like okay moody's believes that this is really strong that kind of gives me a comfort to see what's moody's see in them and, and why are they rating that this and you know so that's why i focus on that one the most i think that's a really good tip and i think that's an important factor for people i think one of the things that is really challenging when you're starting looking at reits is you know how do you start? Should you narrow down into a specific sector? Should you narrow down into a specific company? And what that process of researching really, really looks like? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, for me, it, it, when I got started in REITs, it was what am I really interested in or what am I trying to replicate? You know, and so I think for like, if you're comparing, okay, I can buy an apartment building and, you know, that's how I want to get into real estate investing. A simpler way could be, you know, if you don't have time, you have kids, a job, you know, it, to to look at apartment rates because 
that would mimic what you're looking at. Or, you know, if you're like, well, you know, I would, I really want to own a high quality office building. Well, you could buy an office REIT and that could mimic that idea. And so that, that's a good way to kind of get started is what type of property do I really want to own? Am I really into technology? Then look at data centers and, and kind of get to know like one sector really well that you just, that really intrigues you. And so you mentioned the investor uh, presentations on the site. What other factors do you look at? Um, so because dividends are a big thing with REITs, we I like to look at what's their payout ratio. And um, one thing that differs, so we mentioned REITs versus stocks earlier. Uh, a lot of stocks, you know, it's price, it's the it's their earnings, what a, you know, their earnings per share. And so you look at what's the dividend divided by the earnings per share. Because REITs um, that are different, there's a, there's a lot of depreciation with real estate. And so that compresses the earnings per share, but it doesn't impact their cash flow. So a standard REIT metric is called funds from operation. And that's a basic kind of proxy of their, their ability to pay dividends. So if a REIT pays out less than 100% of its funds from operation, it's safe. However, I'm, you know, if it REITs paying out 100% of their funds from operations and then they can't collect, you know, 5% of their rent, they're in trouble. So I like to see cushion. 80% is a good cushion. More cushion, the better. Like office REITs, it's pretty standard for it to be 50%. A lot of other REITs, 60 to 70% is a, a good cushion. So again, it, it's very sector determined, determined but, um, you know, that, that conservative payout ratio really helps when times get tough. And another thing I think I've cautioned people about this year, and, and we've gotten some questions before about it, is if a company is suspending its dividend or cutting their dividend uh, right now, uh, I would say don't panic because I feel like in other times that could be a sign that the company is in trouble. But right now with everything that's happening, especially if you're looking at a REIT in one of these riskier sectors that we talked about, like office, a hotel, or retail, that actually might be a a very prudent move. I mean, it's not something that they can continue to do long term, but but in the short term, it may it may be a smart move. Yeah, and a, a lot of these reads they made that proactive in because we did not know what was going to happen when everything started shutting down in March. So it's like, all right, we need to like conserve cash. We don't know what our rent's going to be. We don't know what you know the government is going to step in to do, and so. Uh, one of the, the benefits, though, is that REITs have to pay out 90% of their taxable income. So at some point, these dividends, assuming they have taxable income, will come back. Um, you know, hospitality, that they might not come back for a while because they're running losses. But a lot of the others, like uh, retail REITs, if, if they own, for example, grocery stores, that's kind of like the anchor of their portfolio. A lot of those have actually done fairly well. They've collected a, a decent amount of their rent this year. So they'll probably bring their dividends back. Um, so and even like I noticed some several um, healthcare REITs they had to cut their dividends because seniors' housing was under pressure. Now if that bounces back, the dividends could bounce back. That's true. One of the things that I've been tracking is uh, rent collections over time, which has been a huge factor. Less so in apartments because that's actually from what I've seen from tracking the uh, National Multifamily Housing Council rent tracker has has stayed pretty steady. But in retail, we've certainly seen. Uh, rent collections were down a lot uh, through March, April, May, and then started to get a lot better in June and July as things started to reopen. So I feel like that that we're hopefully on a uh, positive upward trajectory there. Yeah. And going back to the whole concept of looking at what's in a, a REIT's portfolio, malls have been much, much, much harder hit than a, a REIT that owns like a a community shopping center. So, you know, the difference with community community shopping center, they typically will have like a big anchor grocery store as, a, as opposed to a mall, which will have a department store. And, uh, you know, the department store wasn't essential, but grocery stores obviously are. And they'll also, you know, they might have out parcels that'll have a, a CVS, they might have some restaurants. And so these businesses stayed open and that's, that's allowed them to collect a much higher proportion of their rent. And, uh, you know, so that's why I think a lot of those retail REITs that cut their dividends that but that own those type of properties, they'll bounce back because they have been collecting their rent. They just didn't know at the time how bad it could get. Well, and I think going back to your REITs versus stock analysis, it really is a long term investment if you're investing in REITs. It doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, both from what I've seen in the data and also just in general to 
try to uh, game the market and get in and get out. These are really long term investments. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's it's compounding because of the dividends. And, you know, one of the things that just as an investor, I've learned over the time, one of the biggest uh, factors in outperformance, uh, and this was a study done by a research firm called Ned Davis Research, they found that companies that grow their dividends consistently, usually annually, they've outperformed the S&P 500 significantly over the long term. Conversely, companies that cut their dividends haven't. Uh, companies that cut their dividends the same were underperforming. And then companies that don't pay a dividend typically didn't do well. Um, and so that shows like a REIT that has a strong balance sheet and is in a growing sector, uh, they tend to, to do very well. And that's why like when I'm looking at a REIT, you know, balance sheet matters, uh, portfolio matters. Like what business is it in? Is it in uh, malls? That's going to be tough. Is it in hotels? That's going to be tough. But if it's in, um, you know, uh, if it's buying apartment buildings in fast growing cities, that's a, an attractive market. If it's building industrial, that's a, you know, that's a, a good market. So if you're looking at those kind of qualities and you're gonna hold for a long term, you should do really well in real estate. So we mentioned that some REITs are down a little bit this year. Are there any ones that uh, you're looking at particularly, do you feel like this is a window of opportunity for people to, uh, to buy REITs now while, there's, while they still may be underperforming a little bit? Yeah, um, I just added um, Avalon Bay communities to my portfolio. That was my newest REIT. I've been watching the multifamily for years uh, because you know I wanted to mimic that idea, of, you know, being a landlord. And they're down. I don't. At one point, I think it was like thirty percent, but their rent collections haven't really change as you mentioned you know apartments have done very well now there's concerns they they own apartments for example in san francisco so there's the concerns that as um in tech companies a lot of people from work from home they don't need to live in san francisco they can move to you know wherever that's that's cheaper say with new york city so that's you know there's always a concern that's why the valuations are down but these guys know what to do they've been in the business for a long time and so that's one that i was like yeah, I'll buy that, you know, great high quality apartments for 30% off. Nice. So uh, as we wrap up, what do you think uh, real estate investment trust investors should be looking for in the third quarter? And what do you think they're going to be seeing? Yeah, I think rent collections this year, nobody's ever talked about rent collections, I don't think, in, in years past. But this year, all of a sudden, everything's on rent collections. What is the rent collection trend? And we want to see those numbers uh, to get back to as close to 100% as possible and not see declines. Uh, you know, and that's office, that's uh, residential, retail. If they can pick up the rent, uh, collection of pace, I think that will give investors more of a of comfort. Hey, these are going to survive the, the you know the downturn. Maybe we sold them off much too deeply earlier this year, so you could see some bounce backs if the rent collection numbers look good. That is a great place to end this. So thank you for your time today. And just a reminder to our listeners is that you can find all of Matt's writing and all of our. Uh, real estate investment trust content in our REITs hub on millionacres.com. We publish new articles every day and uh, we're continuing to build out our REITs coverage. Hey, thanks for having me again. Thank you for tuning in to the Million Acres podcast. I hope you liked today's show. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing through your favorite podcast provider. And if you have any questions, please feel free to drop us a line at help at millionacres.com. Stay well and stay invested. People on this program may have an interest in the deals, offerings, or services they discuss, and Million Acres or The Motley Fool may have a formal recommendation for or against. Always consult a certified tax professional before acting on tax advice, and do not buy or sell assets based solely on what you hear.